start the webinar. We'll let people join for the first moment, and then we'll go ahead and get started. All right, I see people coming in now. All right, so I'm sure people will continue to join over the next minute or so. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone. Good afternoon and welcome to Nisavachia Wealth Advisors and Wealth Springs Q1 2023 Financial Outlook and Portfolio Strategy Update webinar. We appreciate you joining us this afternoon for our first quarterly update of the new year. So we'd like to encourage you to ask questions throughout. If you have questions, please put them in the chat or in the Q&A feature, and we will get to them either throughout the presentation, I'll ask Steve, or we can get to them. Um, we'll have extra time at the end for questions. So I know there's a lot to discuss today, and Steve has plenty of updates to present as usual. So with that, I'd like to introduce you to Steve Galley, our Senior Investment Officer, to take it away. Thank you very much, Katie, as always, and thank you all for joining us today. Um, as usual, I will uh, go through, uh, you know, what's going on out there in, in, in the markets and really what that means in terms of how we're thinking about portfolios and the actions we're taking. Uh, hopefully it will be informative and uh, ideally fun all at the same time. And um, please don't hesitate to ask questions and also provide feedback uh, in regards to what you'd like to see uh, in these presentations. So with that, I will start getting into it. Um, first, I'll talk about, you know, are we really going to have a recession? What's the what's all this recession talk? Is it legitimate? Uh, I think that's been a big topic of late. Uh, and then what that means for portfolio and the investment strategy. So before we get into it, I thought we'd warm up a little bit with some trivia. So uh, I guess what I'm wondering is if anyone out there knows what the common the commonality is for these three fairly fairly famous and I think pretty good movies. Um, and uh, hopefully uh, you are all maybe Googling them right now. But the drum roll, please. The commonality is all these movies were based upon best-selling books written by one of my favorite authors who wrote, in my opinion, one of the best books ever written about Wall Street called Liar's Poker. And that is, uh, and that's Michael Lewis right there. He wrote Liar's Poker. Uh, actually, when I read Liar's Poker uh, after college, I was uh, so enthralled with the book and thought it was so interesting that I, I, I basically decided that I needed to uh, I needed to do uh, join Solomon Brothers, which is what Liars Poker was based on, uh, and 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 get on the bond trading floor myself, which is actually what I did after business school. So I've always kind of looked at Michael Lewis as my hero because not only did he uh, you know work at on Wall Street, but he ended up becoming an incredibly best selling author on all these cool topics. And the more interesting thing is I was listening to a podcast with him on it, uh, I think it was a couple of weeks ago. And it's amazing how he always seems to be in the right place at the right time. Like he wrote Moneyball just when the statistics revolution was taking over baseball. You know, and Moneyball is all about the Oakland A's and how they did really well by seeing things in numbers that the normal baseball establishment and old school scouts couldn't see. Uh, he wrote The Blind Side about, you know, uh, the nuances of football. And so <laughs> when I heard that Michael Lewis uh, was in another right place at the right time, I really couldn't believe it. So I'm not sure if everyone has been watching the headlines, but as everyone knows, uh, in the cryptocurrency world, uh, there has been a massive implosion of a company called FTX, which was uh, headed up by this gentleman here, Sam Bankman Freed, or SVF, as he's known in the media. And the interesting thing is, and again, it all comes down to timing. Guess who was hanging out with Samuel Bankman Freed for several weeks before the implosion happened? That's right, Michael Lewis. So you can rest assured, Michael Lewis is in the process of probably writing another best selling book about all the crazy things that were going on at FTX and all the crazy things that perhaps SBF was doing. Uh, to basically bring that company, uh, you know, down. So uh, 
really good job, Michael Lewis. My one of my favorite authors just continues to to always be in the right place at the right time. So um, lots of headlines out there. Uh, lots sometimes quite negative. I mean, I pulled this one off Bloomberg a little while ago. You know, the, the COVID surge in China affecting millions and millions of people a day. That's kind of scary. Uh, you know, companies are still seeming to do okay, despite the fact that everyone's talking about a downturn in, in the economy. Uh, you know, there were some disasters last year in the stock market in certain companies. I mean, Tesla in 2022 fell 65%. Uh, that was pretty incredible. Uh, you've got, you know, headlines and barons talking about how the market took a dive last year, but maybe stocks still aren't cheap. Um, we have we have an inverted yield curve right now. Uh, you know, what does that mean? Uh, so, you know, if we think about what happened uh, last year and also last quarter, I think it's two very different stories. So the middle column that I'm looking at right now shows the total return in all these different asset classes for the entire year from January to December, uh, the end of December. So you'll see it doesn't really matter what you were invested in. You lost money. Right. There was nowhere to hide. Uh, you know, these blue bars are what the various equity markets did. You know, the S&P, uh, as you know, representing large cap universe was down around 18 uh, percent. Small cap stocks were down over 20 percent. You know, European stocks were down 15 percent. Um, so not good. Technology stocks, by the way, in general, were down a heck of a lot more than that, usually close to 30 percent. Bonds, same story. Bonds were down probably the worst year they've ever had almost in history, double digit losses. It didn't matter whether you were in investment grade corporates, government bonds, you lost money. Um, and even alternative strategies, you know, the so-called hedge funds that supposedly do okay, even when the markets don't, don't do okay, well, they didn't do that well either. So last year was really tough, but look at the fourth quarter. Uh, the fourth quarter actually was pretty darn good. So the fourth quarter did, you know, kind of mitigate some of that damage that was done throughout the first three quarters, you know, uh, you know, especially in Europe. And, you know, so that's pretty interesting, right? Euro the European stocks were up 17 percent in the fourth quarter alone. And a lot of that, I think, has to do with some optimism around the fact that, you know, so far Europe hasn't had that winter that everyone's afraid of in terms of causing an energy crisis because of the, uh, the Russian-Ukraine war. Um, but even, you know, U.S. stocks did, did pretty well and the bond market started to come back. Right. So the fourth quarter, you know, I think people started to see some some reasons for optimism. Now, the big question is, is that going to continue this year? Right. And. I think the jury's still out on that. And, you know, I think, you know, the, the title of the slide is why so gloomy. Because what this slide is showing us, this is produced by uh, the University of Michigan. It's a, it's a consumer sentiment index. Uh, and the, you know, they ba basically do a big poll and they try and you know, take a gauge of the average investor's mood in terms of whether they're bullish or bearish or somewhere in between. And so if you can see right now, interestingly, we used to be pretty much almost at an all time low. And this was probably about uh, a few months ago in this, in this sentiment index. And it's come back uh, pretty healthily in just a few months. And that obviously probably has something to do with the fact that the fourth quarter was pretty good. But I think the more interesting lesson on this slide, you might have seen this before because I think this slide is really interesting, is that the blue dots represent inflection points, either the high of a certain uh, uh, index cycle or a low of an index cycle. And the, and the, percentage, uh, the percentage indicator here is telling you that if you invest when everyone else is pretty gloomy, a la these down moments in the sentiment index, the next 12 month return in the markets are usually really, really good. So the point is when everyone else is feeling gloomy, that's when you should feel pretty good about buying. Uh, and certainly if everyone had bought right here, which was only a few months ago, we would, you would have seen a pretty healthy pop, which is what we just saw in the fourth quarter uh, of last year. But that being said, people are still pretty gloomy because this is this this is where we are today. The uh, this uh, this green diamond, and that's well below the long term average, which is represented by this blue dotted line. Why is that? What, why are people unreasonably gloomy? I mean, well, there, there's a few reasons why. I mean, first of all, there's the lingering effects of the pandemic. Uh, 
I think there's also a very partisan political environment in this country right now, uh, which, uh, you know, probably the most uh, partisan political environment, at least that I can remember in a long time. I think that creates a lot of uh, bad sentiment, bad feelings. Uh, we have still have very high inflation. So things are expensive, right? Food, gas, cars. And we obviously still have a horrible war going on in Europe and the headlines continue to come about, you know, uh, you know, Russia sparing, you know, no, no mercy on, on civilians and, and other atrocities. So that I think is contributing to perhaps some of this gloomy uh, sentiment that's represented by this index. So a lot of that have also has to do with the economy, right? I mean, usually when the economy is doing pretty well, people tend to feel pretty good. So, you know, this kind of shows that we're looking at, you know, the long-term trend growth of our economy since, you know, the turn of the century, since 2000. And, you know, the dip here is what happened during the pandemic when we had, you know, the economy basically came to a standstill. But you can see that we pretty much come back to where we were before the pandemic. And we're, we have a still trending pretty, pretty well, the 2% or so economic growth, which is not bad. We had positive growth in the third quarter. We're expecting, and we don't know yet, the numbers haven't come out yet, but a lot of people are expecting positive growth in the fourth quarter also. Now that contrasts to the first half of the year where we had two consecutive quarters of negative growth. A lot of people think two consecutive quarters of negative growth defines a recession. Technically, that's not correct. A recession is only defined by the National Bureau of Economic Research, and they have not defined that period as a recession. We can talk a little bit more about that. Um, but regardless, I think the real question is, what does that mean in 2023? Are we going to continue to see positive economic growth in 2023? And I think the answer is, it's a mixed bag. We, we, we don't know yet, right? I think a lot of people expect the economy to slow down in 2023, and it already is. And that's because there's a lot of things happening in the economy that is causing that slowdown. Housing is slowing down and there's a lag effect in housing, right? Interest rates have spiked up, but it takes a long time for that to really cause people who want to sell to admit that they're not going to get the price they thought they were and lower prices. Uh, so that still has to work its way through the housing market, but we've already seen housing starts number decline. Um, obviously, mortgage rates are high, so buyers are very scarce. That's going to have a drag on the economy. What else is going to have a drag on the economy? Well, the government is not throwing cash at consumers and at companies anymore, right? The stimulus, all the, all the government support, that's gone. And that was very, that was great for a while. People were flush with cash, they were spending it, but we've already seen an uptick in consumers using credit. And that's because they're no longer getting a lot of the free money that was floating around from government stimulus. That's going to be a drag on the economy. So, I do think that, you know, and of course, if the economy really starts to slow down, that's, of course, where we might see that recession that, that everyone's talking about uh, next year. So let's take a look at a couple of couple of charts here or four charts here, actually. The two charts on the left, uh, you know, that kind of represents the consumer. And, you know, if we remember this chart, well, the consumer is a big part of this 68 percent part of the economy in terms of consumption. That's driven by what people do with their money. So if you look at this chart here, you know, this kind of shows residential investment. Well, residential investment right now is kind of right around its long-term average, you know, since the late 60s. So not terrible. I mean, if we were going to be going into a recession, and by the way, recessions are represented by these gray bars in these charts, you would expect this uh, residential investment number to be a little lower, right? Light vehicle sales, they're lower than the long-term average, but not dramatically low, not like they usually are during a recession. So that's not terrible. And on the right side, when we look at business stats, well, you know, business investment is still kind of hovering around its average, average, average number, right? Even slightly above average. Not what you would expect to see if we were going to head into a recession. Same thing goes for the inventory to sales ratio. You know, usually what happens in a recession, you know, inventory shoot up because no one's buying anything and then they have to get rid of inventory at low prices and everyone's, and you know, their profits go down because of that. We're seeing a little bit of that. That's certainly lower than the long-term average, but 
again, not as low as you would see uh, normally. So it's a mixed bag of, of data. Now, when we talked about how you determine a recession, that's determined by the National Bureau of Economic Research or NIEBR for short. And they use really six key statistics to determine whether or not we're in a recession. Uh, they look at real personal income, they look at non-farm payrolls, they look at household survey employment numbers, they look at consumer spending, they look at re wholesale and retail sales, and they look at industrial production. All very important numbers that really ultimately determine whether or not a recession. You can see very clearly, what is this red bar? Well, that's, that's the recession that we had during the pandemic, when all those six categories turn deeply negative. And that was as clear as day that we had a recession. And I believe they declared that we had a recession a few months after that. By the way, I always wonder, you know, why do they call it non-farm payrolls? You know, why do they cut farmers out? What's, what's wrong with farmers? Uh, so, but so interestingly enough, you know, when you're looking at payroll numbers, there's, a, there's generally a problem uh, including farmers in the monthly jobs data. And that's because I think that that's kind of a historical thing. Uh, because it's a very uh, farm, farm employment is highly seasonal. Uh, and it's complicated by the fact that the structure of the agricultural, ag agricultural industry um, and the characteristics of its workers, uh, it, it, because of that seasonal fluctuation, there's wild variations in the employment in, in, in farmers. And it doesn't align to when these statistics are usually collected. Um, there's a lot of self-employment in farming. There's a lot of unpaid workers. There's a lot of part-time workers. Um, there's some weird partnership structures. And, you know, so, so basically that's why they cut farmers out. And that's why it's called non-farm payrolls. But um, I thought that was pretty interesting in case anyone was wondering about that. But the larger point here is that there is not a ton of red. Yes, we're seeing some red in wholesale and retail sales and retail sales numbers just came out recently and they weren't so great. Uh, so the question is how much more red are we gonna see? Because if we do see a lot more red in terms of these indicators, well, that's usually a pretty good sign of a recession. I actually tend to prefer leading indicators. Um, and so the leading indicators are tend to, and, and so what do I mean by that? Well. There's, a, there's an index published of leading economic indicators, which tend to be better predictors of when you have a recession. So if you look at all the recessions we've had since the 70s, and this chart, the gray bars here, like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So in the eight recessions that we've had since 1970, right, you can see that these blue, these blue uh, parts of the graph, these are when the leading economic indicators are turning downwards. And they've done a pretty darn good job at letting us know when we think we, we're going to be in a recession, um, especially since the 90s. They started turning downward before the, recessions in the, the recession in the early 90s. They started turning downward before the dot-com bubble recession. And they really started turning downward before the, the uh, financial crisis of, uh, of 08. What's happening? And, and by the way, the same thing has started turning down before the flash recession we had because of, because of the pandemic. And what do we see now? They're starting to turn down. And I think this is why so many people are talking about the fact that we might be having a recession soon, uh, because you know these leading economic indicators are turning downwards. I will say though that interestingly enough, if we do have a recession, it's probably gonna be the, one of the first times that people have been so good at predicting that we're gonna have a recession. Normally people don't get that right. Economists are terrible at predicting recession. You know, the old saying goes, economists have correctly predicted, you know, seven of the last, uh, of the last 14 recessions. So the bottom line is the indicators aren't great. Uh, we're not, I'm not sure if this blue, these blue marks are gonna get a lot deeper. We're gonna to have to wait and see. Um, by the way, what are the leading indi economic indicators that are used for that index? And they're all here. And so this is showing us what is turning down. The weekly manufacturing hours worked indicator, way down. Um, the Institute for Supply Management Index, down. Consumer expectations are down. Uh, credit indexes are down. Not everything's down. Uh, you know, some, some, some non-defense order capital goods are still up. 
But in general, a lot of things are turning down. So that's kind of why this is such an interesting uh, statistic, because it's kind of these things are sort of foreshadowing what may occur, you know, in the future. Okay, enough about recessions. Let's talk about inflation. Because inflation is the reason the Federal Reserve has been hiking up interest rates, because the Federal Reserve's mandate is to tame inflation. And they've stated very clearly that that's their number one priority, that they want to break the back of inflation. Uh, and, you know, obviously, the, 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 you know, you can see that the, whether you look at headline CPI or what's known as core CPI, which strips out food and energy, inflation is pretty high, you know, still hovering above 6%. Uh, well above, you know, the long-term trend and certainly well above where the Federal Reserve wants it to be. So that being said, though, the other thing we've seen here is we've seen these numbers start to turn down. That means, hopefully, that inflation has rolled over. It is starting to cool. And I think we have probably passed peak inflation that we've seen. So this might mean that we're at a potential turning point. If we're past peak inflation, that probably means we're past, we're certainly past peak oil prices. Oil prices peaked in June of last year, around $120, $25 a barrel. They're well below $80 a barrel right now, or at least when this chart was done about last month. The dollar peaked in the fourth quarter of last year. That's come down. Interest rates peaked in the fourth quarter last year. They have come down. Sometimes, that's a good sign, right? So I think that's one of the reasons why it's so hard to read the markets right now, because the markets are saying, well, if we're packed past the peak on some of these things, isn't that a good sign? And you know, the answer is, yeah, that could be a very good sign. But I still think one of the most interesting things going on here is the fact that we still have pretty much record low unemployment. You know, our unemployment rate in this country is still hovering below or around three and a half percent, which is very, very low. Very rarely can you have a recession when you have low unemployment. More importantly, if you're trying to fight inflation like the Federal Reserve is, the old saying goes that in order to break the back of inflation, you have to break wage inflation. Because when wage inflation is going up, well, what does that mean? It means people are making a lot more money, right? They're getting paid more in their jobs. And when they're getting paid more, well, they can spend more. And that kind of is a self-reinforcing thing. More spending uh, supports higher prices. So the Fed, of course, can't just tell companies to stop hiring people or fire people. But what they can do is they can make the environment problematic enough that company profits are hurt, that forces them to cut staff and lay people off. And that is when wage inflation tends to cool off. And actually, we have actually started to see some signs of wage inflation cooling off. So the thing about the unemployment rate, though, is that, and I've talked about this before, when it starts to go up, it usually doesn't stop, or at least it doesn't stop until it's gone up substantially. It's kind of like a freight train. Once it gets moving, it keeps moving. Uh, so if we look at unemployment since, uh, you know, basically the post-war era, every time it starts moving up, it's moved up on average by two and a half percent. So if that happens this time, that means unemployment's going to go up to around six percent. If unemployment goes up to six percent, we're going to have a problem, right? That's, that's definitely going to be recessionary. So when people talk about a soft landing, what they're really hoping for is that somehow the Fed is able to slow the economy down, which would bring inflation down without getting unemployment onto that moving freight train where it's going to keep going up and not stop, which would be more problematic for the economy. So, you know, I, I, I don't believe in soft landings. I think that's almost impossible to, to pull off. I don't really think the Fed has ever technically really achieved a soft landing, maybe a bumpy landing. Uh, I think maybe that's the best we can hope for is maybe a bumpy landing. You know, maybe the unemployment rate ticks up, but it doesn't actually tick up as much as it you know, usually does when it starts moving up. So I think that's going to be an important number to watch. And as we always talk about, what does the market care about most, especially the stock market? It cares about earnings. Uh, so what does this chart show us? Uh, it shows us that, you know, this, the, 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 the green line is the S&P 500 index, uh, you know, for the last seven or eight years or so, the blue line is earnings. Uh, and as you can see, as earnings go, usually the S&P 500 goes. You know, when earnings suffer, so does the index. When earnings are going up, so does the index. So 
Interestingly enough, we've had some choppiness in the index now because earnings have not been going up. Uh, you know, and that's again, what the Fed is doing is they're hurting company profits by jacking up interest rates. You know, it makes the cost of capital go up. It increases the prices of things. That tends to take a bite out of earnings. So that's kind of what we're seeing. And that's why the market doesn't like that. Because what, what are you doing when you're buying a stock? You're paying for the future earnings of that, of that company. And when earnings are going down, you know, you're not as excited about owning that stock. So that's another thing we always keep an eye on are what are happening to company earnings. <clears throat> um, I want to talk about the bond market real quick, because again, last year was a very unique year for fixed income. Uh, and, and obviously, you know, if you were only invested in bonds and always thought, well, I'm, invest I'm invested in all bonds, I, it's, that's got to be safe. Last year proved that that's not always the case. So, you know, tongue in cheek in terms of the, the, the heading of this slide that lightning doesn't strike in the same place twice. Well, <laughs> It did last year in the bond market. And so what I mean by that is if you look at the gray bars here, this is the return of the Barclays U.S. Aggregate Bond Index. So basically the return of bonds in general uh, since the mid 70s. And as you can see, bonds almost never have a negative year. Uh, they've only the bonds have only basically had a negative year five times in the last 45 years. And even if they did have a negative year, it's never been down by more than 5%, except last year. <laughs> and by the way, last year was the first time the bond market ever had two consecutive negative years. We had a slightly negative year in 2020 when bonds were down on average about 2%. Last year was when we had bonds down by over 13% or so, a double digit decline, which has never happened before. That is why last year was such a really rough year. And you know, who do we have to thank for that? Well, thank you very much, Federal Reserve. That's what happens when you raise interest rates so furiously and so fast. When interest rates go up, bond prices go down. So that was really what played out in the bond market. But as you can see, actually year to date, the bond market's been pretty happy, up over 3%, which is actually a very dramatic move to have happened in, you know, give or take a half a month or so. Uh, and why is that? Well, that's because I think people are starting to hope and speculate that the Federal Reserve is done with their aggressive rate hikes. <clears throat> now, there's a, still a lot of debate going on about that, but certainly they're going to at least slow down. So kind of finishing out that point about bonds, I think this is an interesting way to look at it. And we can thank our partners at BlackRock for this. If you look at uh, annu average annual bond returns based upon the starting yield of a particular year, it's a very good indicator of what you might expect for the next several years from bonds. So if you start off with the average bond yield being at only two and a half percent, or I'm sorry, if you start off, uh, if you start off an investment cycle in bonds where yields are basically hovering around 2% or less, well, the average over the next five years that you're going to get from bonds is really going to be around two, two and a half percent. However, if you start investing in bonds when the yields range between four and five percent, which they are right now, the average five year return on bonds for the next several years is around five percent. Basically saying that right now, bonds aren't a bad place to be. And we should have fairly reasonable expectations for bond returns, given the fact that the yields right now are very much uh, more attractive than they were only a year ago. So that's one of the reasons that we have been more comfortable with bonds now, and we have been increasing our allocation to fixed income in our portfolios. So, and I'll, and I'll of course, speak to more of that uh, later when I get into the portfolio strategy. So bonds are back. Now, stock market, just as it's very rare to have two consecutive down years in bonds, of course, until last year, the same thing goes through for stocks. As a matter of fact, again, this shows the gray bar represents the return of the S&P 500 going back to 1980. The only time in the last um, uh, 25 years or so that we've had 
I'm sorry, 45 years or so, that we've had consecutive declines in the S&P 500 was after the dot-com bubble burst. That's when we had actually three straight down years. Other than that, every time we had a down year, the market went up. That held true in the 80s. It held true uh, in, in pretty much in the 90s. Obviously, it did not hold true in the 2000s because of that's post the dot-com bubble bursting, but it's held true in the 2010 decade as well as so far this year, uh, this, this decade. Now, we had a very down year in the equity markets last year of you know, 18, 19%. I don't think we're in a position that we were after like at the economy and, and, and companies in general, uh, like after the dot-com bubble burst. At that point, there was rampant speculation. Uh, companies were not as strong as they were today in terms of balance sheet strength. The consumer was overstretched in those days compared to today. So I actually think there's reason to believe that we are not going to see another down year in the equity markets. And as a matter of fact, the equity markets are already up this year not up by a lot, but they are up, which is a nice thing to see so far in January. But if history is a guide, we should feel pretty good about the fact that, you know, rarely does do equity markets decline two consecutive years. Now, if you compare this chart to the bond market, you know, a lot of people ask, well, you know, if the average return of equities is higher than bonds, well, then why wouldn't everyone just always invest in equities? Why bother with bonds? And, you know, the short answer is, because equities are much more volatile. And volatility in the financial world is associated with risk. And so if you have to worry about the fact that you might need your money at, in, in a short time frame, and you know that you're investing in an asset class that is very volatile, that can be dangerous. And that's why a lot of times we always counsel, if you have a long-term time horizon, Yes, it pays off to take risk because then the volatility isn't uh, as important. Volatility tends to smooth out over long periods of time. But you know, you can just see this chart compared to the bond chart that we were on before. Equity returns are much more volatile. Um, okay, now I've beaten the table about international stocks now so many times that you know I've learned not to beat the table about international stocks, but. I do think it's really important to point out that we can't ignore stocks outside the US. And you know, well, why is that? Well, again, that's because stocks outside the US are priced much more reasonably. In other words, for every dollar of earnings that I want to buy for a company outside the US, I'm paying much less for it than a dollar of, of earnings that I buy for a similar company in the US. Um, the other thing about international stocks is that dividend yields are a lot higher internationally uh, by a pretty substantial margin. That's, that's great because even if the stock itself goes nowhere, you're earning a dividend. So not only do we think the valuations are better in international stocks, but we also know the dividends are better. Um, and it doesn't just stop there. You know how we were talking about how US earnings right now are a little choppy. Well, the earnings picture internationally isn't as gloomy, I think, as in the US. Uh, as a matter of fact, because earnings expectations internationally have been low for so long, that's why there's a little more optimism in company earnings internationally. So the earnings picture internationally right now is a little brighter than the US. So that's another reason why we believe that we should not be underweight international stocks uh, in the majority of our portfolios because they're just a better bargain right now. And there's a lot more potential there, we think, for better risk-adjusted returns. So, and the other thing I haven't mentioned is currency fluctuation. And, you know, usually when the dollar is strong, uh, that's not a great thing if you are uh, invested internationally. But as you might've recalled from a previous slide, we might've already hit peak dollar, at least in the current cycle. And if the dollar starts to weaken, that can be a great tailwind to international stocks. And it's a great way to hedge your portfolio against a weak dollar is to have a component of international equity. So that's another thing to keep in mind. Uh, this kind of reinforces my point. Uh, this is, this is in specifically in regards to emerging markets. 
um, you know, which basically means that when you have dollar weakness, emerging markets tend to do really, really well. Um, and that's, you know, we're already starting to see that play out a little bit uh, in terms of, you know, returns from the emerging market sectors right now. So that's one of the reasons why we aren't ignoring, ignoring the emerging part of international, our international equity allocation. Um, I'm going to skip through this slide, but it sort of just reinforces my point that things in the US may be softening, things in Europe, not necessarily so. Okay. Therefore, after all that, what really should investors be doing? Well, I think really the bottom line is, and what we always say is you really need to stay invested. You need to stay the course regardless of you know, what's going on out there. So and I think this is a great illustration of that. Um, this basically tells us that over the last 72 years, right, since 1950, uh, the S&P 500 has declined by 20% or more 11 times. So, you know, it happens. It's not that uncommon. If for any of you who gamble and play the game of craps, it's kind of like the same odds of rolling a seven, you know, if 11 times out of the last 72 years is basically a 15.3% chance of that happening. And, you know, obviously a 20% decline is very uncomfortable. So any given year, there's a 15% chance the market might drop by 20%. It's kind of almost like the same chance of rolling a seven in the game of craps. You know, a seven is, you roll a seven six out of 36 times every time you roll a pair of dice. Uh, that's about 15, 16% or so. Um, so it happens. It's not that uncommon. But what is important to realize is that when we do have a decline in the markets, one year after that decline, the market returns on average have been excellent. So if after these, after these big market drops, and let's say the average has been about 34% since 1950 when we have had a big decline, one year from that, the bottom of the, the one year from the bottom, we've had a 40% upside, 40% return. And the three-year average return after the market bottom has been about 15, 16% a year. That's great. That's why you need to usually stay invested and not panic when things go down, because as they recover, you know, that's when, that, that's when you need to be especially invested. So I always like to point this out that it's, you know, market timing is, 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 is extremely difficult and, you know, staying the course is very important. So what do we need to pay attention to in 2023? I mean, I've, I've touched on a lot of that, but this kind of rehashes it a bit. Um, you know, I think we think the U.S. dollar might be weakening a bit and past peak. We think the inflation outlook, it might be past peak and interest rates might be past peak. What does that mean? Well, it means that maybe the Federal Reserve is being successful in slowing our economy down. And maybe that means they can start stop hiking. They can start to slow down their interest rate hiking that they've been doing so dramatically over the last year or so. If the Fed slows down, we can no, we no longer have to follow that mantra of don't fight the Fed. Instead of being restrictive, the Fed may have to become more accommodative. And that certainly is something the market would be elated to see. Uh, I don't, I think it's too early to tell. I think the Fed still might raise rates by a half a percent in their next meeting. Uh, we'll have to wait and see. Some people think it'll only be a quarter percent. Uh, there's still a lot of debate about that. But I think the Fed, and I heard an interview with one of the Fed uh, governors the other day, they pretty much want, I think they want to see the, uh, the short-term rate level get up to about 5%, which would mean that they would hike it at least another half percent in the next few months. Um, Again, though, we were, as we were looking at that kind of gloom index or consumer sentiment index, sometimes a lot of pessimism means that it's time to be optimistic. You know, you can't, you know, following the crowd usually doesn't help you much in, in investing. So, you know, having the stomach to invest when other people are scared usually pays off. Uh, but again, a lot of that's going to depend on whether companies can deliver on their earnings. And so that's why everyone's going to be laser focused on the earnings reports that have already been coming out for the fourth quarter. Uh, and will continue to come out. Uh, we talked about unemployment. Going to be interesting to see whether that freight train gets moving up and whether it keeps going or whether it stops around 4%. I think that remains to be seen. 
I will say that one of the count the, the the things that's keeping the unemployment rate low is that there's just not enough there's not a lot of available workers. You know, companies are still looking for certain skill sets that they just can't find. So there's still a lot of demand out there, and that may actually keep the unemployment rate from going up. Uh, you know, dramatically. Uh, U.S. housing market that might be a rough ride in 2023. I think. More importantly, we got to pay attention to what happens in the China housing market because China, whether we like it or not, is still the second largest economy in the world. Their housing market matters. In the great financial crisis in this country in 08, when the housing market imploded, China actually, because their housing market was strong, that actually helped mitigate some of the damage in this country, believe it or not. That's not the case now. If we have a housing market problem in this country, China might have a bigger housing market problem because their housing market is actually close to bubble territory. It's basically, if you look at statistics, it's the most expensive housing market in the world uh, if you look at you know, housing uh, valuation metrics. So, uh, and they know that, and they're trying to slowly prick that bubble without causing too much disruption, which is extremely difficult as they're emerging from you know, their COVID lockdown. So that's something to pay attention to. Uh, bond yields are at decade, decade highs. Is it time to take advantage of that? We think so. Um, but remember, there is an inverted yield curve. What does that mean? It means short-term rates are higher than long-term rates. And that usually means that the bond market traders think there's going to be a recession. Because if there was a recession, what does that mean? It means the Fed has to cut short-term interest rates. And that means the inversion would end because short-term rates would come down and then long-term rates would no longer be higher than short-term rates. That's what the long bond guys think. The guys who are investing in the 10-year treasury at three, three and a half percent, even though they could be getting four, four and a half percent if they buy a one year. So that's why an inverted yield curve tends to be a good recession predictor. So, and then of course, we still have this horrible war in Europe. Um, I think that's a big wild card. Will that be resolved uh, anytime in the near future? I think if it is, I think that would be really positive news for the market and, and the global economy in general. So these are some of the things we're watching, but to sum it all up, and I know we're getting kind of at the 45 minute mark here. What does that all mean what we're doing? Well, you know, like I said, bonds, not a bad place to be now. And I think future return expectations for bonds, we have reason to believe that that's pretty, pretty good. Uh, so uh, we're gonna continue to increase our exposure to bonds. And you know, again, if we do enter a recession and equities you know, don't do so well this year, that bond exposure is really gonna help out, right? Because we think bonds are gonna be do just fine uh, in that environment. So we will be slowly but surely moving to overweight in bonds and especially uh, we like investment grade corporate bonds or, or another way to put that is high quality corporate bonds. Um, we're gonna stay neutral on the US. We don't really think we need to be underweight. Uh, again, part of the reasoning behind that is we think we're past some of those peak numbers like past peak inflation, uh, past peak dollar, past peak interest rates. So that might mean that there's reason to believe the US equities will do okay, especially if we end up not going into a recession or even if we go into a very mild recession. But there could be some volatility and trouble, especially if we do have a recession, especially if the Fed keeps jacking up interest rates and overdoes it. So we wanna stay neutral there. Um, but as I mentioned, we do think it's smarter to not be underweight international anymore. We think, we, want, we think it's more important to at least have a neutral exposure to international stocks. Once again, better valuations, nicer dividends, potentially better earnings, and the fact that we might have seen peak dollar already, all of which speaks well to international, which by the way, for a long time now, international is underperformed, underperformed, and eventually that turns around. And by the way, as we saw already in the fourth quarter, boy, that was a quick turnaround. So, you know, it can happen fast uh, in terms of international outperformance, and you don't want to be caught underweight when that happens. So <clears throat> these are the uh, these are the things we're doing in the portfolios. Uh, I hope that this was informative. I hope it made sense. By all means, please reach out with any questions. And with that, I will open it up to Q&A. Great, thank you, Steve. Come back on. Okay, as a reminder, if you guys have any questions, please put them in the chat. Um, I do have one for you. So I know we've been hearing a lot about how last year was not a good year for investors. And how are you feeling going into this year? And are you more or less confident kind of going off the start? Right, good question. I mean, hopefully I did speak to that a bit, you know, in terms of what we're thinking about this year. 
Uh, I have to say, I'm definitely confident that this year will be better than last year. Now that's, that's kind of setting a low bar, right? Cause last year was so horrible. So it's easy to say this year will be better than last year, but, um, but I, 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 I am very confident that usually when you have such a down year in equities, you end up having a positive return in equities in the following year. I, I, I would find, I would be pretty surprised if we have another negative return in equities this year. And I absolutely am confident that we will not have a negative return in bonds this year. Now, that being said, this is just my opinion. This is, you know, my, my, my prediction. It's certainly not fact. And, uh, you know, don't, don't, uh, uh, don't, don't beat me up if I'm wrong, but, you know, certainly uh, there's, for a lot of the reasons I stated, I do think there's reason to believe that this year will be a lot kinder to investors. That's certainly been what history has taught us, that markets do tend to be resilient uh, and come back. Um, and I do think the market is really looking for, for anything to hang their hat on to give an excuse to, to, to move up. Uh, you know, I think investors are, are still licking their wounds from last year but I think they're ready to put their cash back to work this year. Great, thank you. Okay, and last question, unless anyone else has one, is um, is there an area or sector you think will be a top performer this year? I know last year we talked a lot about energy, that was kind of a favorite, um, things like that. You see that happening again. So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, uh, a good question. Um, and it also gets into the whole idea of, you know, whether you want to be more exposed to like value type stocks or growth type stocks. Um, you know, uh, just, you know, energy was a great, great performer last year. I mean, without, as a matter of fact, it was the only great sector last year. Everything else was horrible. Uh, so, so, but that rarely repeats itself. Uh, I do think it's, it's rare to see uh, a sector do really well one year and then continue to do well the next year. Now, that being said, I do think that energy had has still has some good momentum this year. Um, uh, I, I think energy earnings are going to be strong this year, but in some ways the market has already anticipated that a bit. Um, so some of the sectors we really think are important this year, especially when we we're still operating in a high degree of uncertainty. You know, we like healthcare. We think healthcare is is, is fairly defensive in the sense that you know obviously if we have a recession, you know you still got to go to the doctor. Uh, so we, we, we do think healthcare is a pretty good sector on top of the fact that it's more value oriented because the dividends in the healthcare sector tend to be higher than average. That's a good thing. We actually aren't afraid of tech anymore. I mean, tech took a real beating last year. You know, the NASDAQ composite was down probably give or take 30, 32 uh, percent. So tech has really been hit hard. Again, we've seen some tech resilience already this year. Um, I think there's reason to believe that, you know, uh, tech stocks can can rebound a bit from from how much they they got hit, and especially if we uh, if we don't really have a uh, a recession or if we just have a mild recession, I think I think the tech recovery could could be a good place to be. Uh, uh, another 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 sector we're, we're we're you know thinking about is um is consumer defensives. Consumer defenses are things like you know. Procter & Gamble, for example, is a consumer defensive stock, is consumer defensive stock. Costco is a consumer defensive stock. You know, it's the type of, type of thing where companies sell stuff that people buy, whether you have a recession or not. Um, you know, Procter & Gamble, you still buy soap and shampoo and lipstick, whether the economy is good or not. Uh, you know, they tend to be pretty good performers when you have an uncertain environment or if you have a recession. Uh, so, you know, if you have a little bit, you know, more exposure to the technology sector, you know, that's more growthy oriented. But then if you have that healthcare consumer defensive exposure, which is more value on chain, that's kind of a good barbell, you know, a good hedge. Uh, that's that's some of the time, some of the way we're thinking about things. Um, so, yeah, so that's kind of some of the thinking we have around some of the sectors. That makes sense. Yeah. All right. We do have one more question and then we'll cut it off because I know we're a little bit over. Um, this question is, what about our government spending more and our debt? Why can't we pay our bills? Interesting question. Yeah, and that also gets into the, uh, the, 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 the debt ceiling uh, debate that will be playing out in Congress. And, and, and again, also part of the bad mood that, that we see these days is, is this, this incredible partisanship that we see in, in our government. Um, you know, there, there are some opinions that that whole debt ceiling thing is, 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 really, uh, is really an inane uh, situation that, that should be just uh, uh, eliminated. But um, I, I think, I mean, the short answer is why can't we pay our debt? Well, it's because in general, politicians are short-term, short-term thinkers. 
You know, politicians care about the next election cycle. They don't think about things 10, 20, 30 years down the road. That's just the nature of politics. And so, uh, you know, that's part of the reason that, you know, we have a ballooning debt problem uh, or are unable to manage our debt because usually we don't have long-term thinking. Uh, and that's, you know, there's a lot of interesting things that are being debated about that in terms of how do we fix that problem? You know, what do we have to do to eliminate this, this short-termism that exists in politics, which guides a lot of the government's, you know, spending habits? Uh, I, I wish I had an answer to that. Um, but, you know, at, at the end of the day, our debt situation is certainly not as bad as, you know, some other countries. I mean, you know, relative to Japan, if you look at their debt situation, we actually look pretty good. Uh, so, you know, I think I think one of the other answers to you know how ultimately we can not worry too much about our debt is that sometimes you can grow yourself out of a debt problem. You know, and if we continue to have, we if we continue to be a country that's like the innovation uh, country of choice, where people want to be to build great things, produce great things because they get rewarded for that. That type of and that engine of growth, the innovation engine, is what allows, you know, allows the economy to still do well, despite carrying a debt load, because you kind of are innovating your way out of that problem. Uh, the danger is that if we start losing our, our edge in key industries, you know, such as tech, uh, semiconductors, cybersecurity, defense, uh, things like that, uh, you know, that's when, that's when we, 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 we won't be able to grow our, our way out of a, a debt problem. So that's, you know, something to think about. Great, thank you. All right, um, I think that wraps up the questions then. I just wanna remind everyone, we will send out the recording um, in maybe the next couple days. And there will also be a survey when the webinar ends. We'll include it in the email as well, but let us know uh, qu any questions you might have, specific topics you'd like Steve to touch on. And of course, we appreciate your feedback. So that's all I got, Steve. Thank you everyone for, for listening and joining uh, and uh, look forward to seeing you next time. Great, thank you everyone. Have a nice night, thanks.